I'm going to show you uh, the possibilities of Octopus Deploy. Um, this is a, a tool that I've been using for uh, with mm, small breaks uh, for like two or three years. Um, so I'd like to share some details with you. And uh, let's start with the agenda for today. I will talk uh, a few words about Octopus Deploy as a tool. Uh, then we'll go through the glossary uh, to know some terms uh, when speaking uh, about Octopus Deploy. And then uh, we can, I can show you some basic concepts um, that are uh, available in Octopus Deploy. Um, then the next point will be deployment methods available uh, to you when you use Octopus Deploy and we'll see um, manual and automatic deployments. And the last point would be um, a nice feature of Octopus Deploy. I think uh, it's uh, operational runbooks, um, but that's, that's just a brief agenda. We'll get to that uh, later. Um, so let's start with a few details about Octopus Deploy. Um, first of all, uh, the name suggests that it's deployment tool, and it is. Uh, so it's quite important to understand that this is only CD tool or deployment tool. Uh, there is no CI um, possibility. I mean, it always is, but uh, this tool is not um, aimed to uh, provide any CI uh, possibilities. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, by default, it's hosted in Azure uh, Cloud because Octopus is a, an external company and they are, they are having their Azure subscriptions and they host uh, infrastructure. So it's um, cloud provided one. You can also self-host Octopus uh, by installing some software on your virtual machines or EC2 instances if you want to have uh, Octopus deploy in AWS, for example. Um, today we'll focus on a cloud hosted uh, one. So um, there is a good documentation on how to install Octopus on yourself. Um, but that's not the point for today. Um, the architecture is a typical server agent. So you have one server that communicates with several multiple agents. Mm. When it comes to Octopus Deploy itself, it's fully backed by API resources. So every action you do in the user interface, you can also um, mimic the same actions uh, through API requests using CURL or Postman. And if you do any action, uh, that will be recorded and it can be also reviewed in audit history. So that's a nice feature too, and it's enabled by default. Um, there is pretty useful documentation. Um, and the one thing that I think it's nice, uh, is that Octopus uh, company uh, provides some best practices when using Octopus Deploy. And I know they are gathering like a lot of feedback from their users so that uh, they know how their customers use Octopus Deploy and they like uh, try to fit to their deployment methods. Um, there is also quite a good library of community step templates uh, that you can use so other members of uh, communities uh, of community of octopus deploy um, prepare some step templates you can use them you can write your own yeah write your own ones and share them and the last thing about octopus deploy it's that it's paid it's external um, provided by octopus company and basically you uh, you pay for uh, amount of deployment targets that you use. Um, so that's maybe what, like one uh, con of uh, Octopus Deploy, but maybe after this presentation, you will consider it in your future assignments uh, or projects. So 
let's go quickly through glossary or um, to know some terms when it comes to Octopus Deploy. Um, the first thing is a project. So it's a basic application unit or microservice. So uh, this is like your application. And uh, I've specifically um, put here microservice because uh, Octopus is designed I mean, it, it suits well, uh, like microservice um, architecture of your applications. So you can have a, a single container as a project. And then uh, we have a release and release uh, it's in Octopus world, it's a, mm, in, an important uh, thing that it's a snapshot of three, thing, three things, a package version, project process and variables. Uh, when it comes to package version, it's the version of your package and we will see that in a moment. Um, project process, uh, it's like all the steps that you execute when you deploy uh, your release and variables, um, they are also snapshotted. So uh, whenever you create a release, uh, the current values of variables are like saved. And this particular snapshot thing uh, is a really nice feature that enables um, quickly rolling back to uh, your previous deployment. When it comes to package, it's a single archive um, containing application assets. So your application code, maybe some dependencies, uh, some files that you would like to parse or uh, process. Mm. Next thing we have deployment and it's the event of executing a release and we know what is release uh, by now. Uh, and this uh, event, I mean the, the, the method, the, the, the steps that are uh, executing during deployment are defined by a deployment process. And the deployment happens uh, to specific deployment target um, in a specific environment. So that's uh, also a good thing to know. When it comes to deployment target, it's just the target of deployment. It's attached to one or more environments and we will see some uh, examples of deployment targets uh, later in the presentation. Um, we have also workers, and this is a compute resource. So for example, EC2 instance in AWS, and workers are used to run deployments that are not scoped to deployment targets. So let's imagine you want to um, run a script like PowerShell script or Bash script. You don't want to run the same script on each deployment target because uh, you want to fetch maybe some data from external site. Uh, you can run this kind of script on a worker and we will see workers in use uh, in the demo session. Um, next we have lifecycle. And this is the order of release promotion. So how release um, are like uh, executed how the release is executed through um, environments. So example of lifecycle would be, okay, first deploy to UAT, then deploy to uh, prod, then deploy to disaster recovery, or maybe um, you could have another, ex another example of lifecycle, uh, deploy straight to production or um, omit production, but deploy to dev, QA, and UAT. So examples are uh, are there, and we'll take a closer look on life cycles too in later. Um, there are channels, and channels are simply associations between life cycle and package. Um, account, which is Octopus way of providing credentials, and we can have different authentication methods. We can use IAM from AWS. Um, so for example, IAM access key for your IAM user, 
we can have SSH Keeper. We can also have like other authentication methods from other cloud providers, but let's stick to AWS. And the last one is tenant. And it's useful when you have different customers and you have multi-customer business. So you have, let's say you have your application and you host your application to multiple um, clients. Uh, so each of your customer can have their own tenant and they, uh, they will have their own configuration, their own variables, credentials, etc. Okay, so let's uh, quickly jump to Octopus Console um, just to have a look on how it's, uh, how it's done. Yeah. Okay, so this is a dashboard and uh, the, main, the main page um, provides a matrix. Uh, this matrix is, uh, I mean, in the first column we have uh, projects that are available in Octopus. As you can see, I have two uh, Lambda projects. Uh, the first row uh, provides environments that are created um, in, this, uh, in this Octopus instance, uh, so that here in those cells, there would be releases and their statuses uh, when it comes to um, yeah, when it comes to releases, uh, we'll see green icons or uh, red icons uh, that will show the dates of the release, the version names, etc. So as you can see, we have also a projects tab, uh, which has those two projects. And maybe let's quickly have a look on, on the project. There is an overview. Uh, and there would be releases when we, when we create one later. Uh, there is also a process when we have where we have like those steps that are executed during deployment event, um, channels that I mentioned, um, releases. Uh, there will be a list here, and uh, some advanced uh, settings that we'll um, see later. I mean, some of them. There is also infrastructure where you can see. In the overview, uh, there are environments, there are deployment targets. I mean, I am not using any deployment targets at the moment, uh, just, to, just to be sure that it's uh, simple enough for you to understand. I mean, for the simplicity, um, worker pools, workers, etc. cetera. Um, there is also accounts here. And as I mentioned, accounts is, uh, an account is a, an object in Octopus that you can provide some credentials. Uh, for me, it's access key to my IAM user, and we will use this account later. Um, some maybe, uh, there is also a library where you can see all your packages that are uh, pushed to um, your Octopus instance. And that's like the, the most interesting one. Uh, once at the, at the moment, um, so that we will be foco focusing on those. Okay, so let's uh, quickly go back to presentation. So, as I mentioned, the project is basic application or microservice. So, as an example, you can have Kubernetes deployment with a single microservice. It could be yeah, deployment, it could be a replica set or maybe a um, daemon set, as you wish. Um, you can also have a Windows service. Uh, you can also have, as an example, a Terraform template that contains all your infrastructure. And this Terraform template would be applied during a um, deployment event. You can also have database projects where you manage schema of the database using some third party applications like uh, Liquibase or Roundhouse. Um, there is also a possibility to write anything in those um, in those uh, programming language uh, languages listed here. So uh, like the, the main um, 
the basic ones for uh, Octopus would be PowerShell and Bash. So please do have in mind that uh, Octopus is hosted in Azure. So Azure is Microsoft. The, uh, then PowerShell is uh, the main, like the main um, language here. But you can also use Bash and Python 3, as you wish. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so somehow Octopus uh, um, is a part of Microsoft uh, or Azure somehow, or it is just uh, it is no. just hosted by Azure. It's hosted by Azure. I okay. believe they are not connected. They just use Microsoft Azure as a cloud provider, and uh, I believe some of their code is written in PowerShell as well. So. Okay, um, thank you. That is the connection, but uh, like nothing more. When it comes to variables, um, we'll see, no, uh, but values uh, can be scoped to um, some properties and I will explain that in a moment. Um, so they can be scoped to environment, target roles, targets, processes, deployment steps and channels. Uh, and this means that value can have a, I mean, variable can have a different value for each environment. So you can have like um, database name, for example, uh, and imagine you use uh, one database name, so database one, for example, uh, and this database name is uh, proper for your uh, UAT and dev environment, but in production, uh, you are using database two um, as a database name. So that's done by scoping the variable value uh, to a specific property, in this case, environment. So in, in variables, you would have uh, a variable name and the list of values and each value can be uh, specific to environment, uh, to a target that you choose, etc. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, when I like when we were uh, in this uh, glossary uh, slide, um, a release is creating a snapshot of variable values. So that's uh, for the rollback uh, feature. Uh, variables can be grouped in variable sets so that you can reuse them in multiple projects. So let's say you have some common variables that you use. So uh, for example, AWS region, uh, you can create a variable set called AWS variables. You can put the region there and you can reference, uh, you can refer to this variable in this variable set in multiple projects so that you can uh, reuse the variable and not uh, copy and paste uh, the values many times in multiple projects. Um, I also mentioned uh, tenants. So variables can have different values uh, for every tenant and it's quite natural. If you have multiple customers, they are, their applications might have some custom names. So that's also a case when it comes to um, variables. Uh, the reference is written like this. So it's a uh, hash sign and uh, braces. And inside the braces, you have variable name. Uh, you can also apply filters uh, to the variable name so that you can get the value. Uh, the current value of your variable, you can lower them. Uh, I mean, uh, parse to lowercase, you can trim the white spaces or uh, simply encode in base64. Uh, those variables are available to you and you use them by um, referring to this uh, variable name and you put pipe and name of the filter. And the recommendation from Octopus is to use namespaces so that you can easily find where your variable is, uh, is stored. 
So for example, you can have shared.aws.accountID and you know that you will look for this uh, variable value in, in the shared.aws uh, um, library set, uh, sorry, variable set. And you will look for the account ID variable that is stored there. Okay, um, I mentioned deployment targets. They are also called uh, tentacles in Octopus world. So let's divide them into uh, several categories. When it comes to kind of um, deployment target, we can have Windows or Linux or Mac based uh, virtual machines. Um, we can have Kubernetes clusters as well. We can have, for example, in AWS, we can have ECS cluster. Um, so that's the kind of deployment target. We can also divide them by their type. So by default, I mean that the most um, used, the most frequently used types are um, polling uh, tentacles. Uh, they are there are also listening ones and SSH. The difference between polling and listening, it's uh, mainly because of uh, security issues. Um, let me explain. If you have listening tentacles, you probably want to um, open up some ports that your tentacle would be listening. Um, and this is not possible in many environments where where you don't have public IPs and public access to your uh, infrastructure. So uh, if that's your case, then polling tentacle uh, would be good enough. We can also um, assign roles to deployment targets. And the role uh, for the deployment target is, I would say it's a label that de describes the possibilities. So um, given, the example that we have ECS cluster, uh, we can have roles like, um, so this ECS cluster can host Fargate containers, or maybe it can host uh, specific applications. You would have application name as a role. Um, sometimes it's, um, it's also um, necessary to choose the role uh, in your deployment steps. So, Basically, those are custom. You can name them as you want. So uh, there are there is a lot of possibilities when it comes to uh, choosing roles for your deployment targets. And workers, which are similar to deployment targets, but um, like I mentioned, they are um, they execute tasks that are not specific to deployment targets. So. Let's imagine we have a deployment target, with, which is a virtual machine. If you deploy to a specific deployment target, so your package will land on this virtual machine and the application would start. For workers, um, they are more um, specific to the processes that do not require a specific deployment target. Um, so like I mentioned, if you, for example, example, would like to run the script that fetches some data from external um, external site, website, you don't really, um, it doesn't really matter to you um, where it will be executed. So workers are great for this purpose. But by default, there is there are two worker pools that are provided when it comes to cloud subscription in Octopus. So those are the default ones. You can also create them manually. I mean, manually. Uh, you can also uh, use infrastructure as code, uh, as always. But uh, I mean, you self-host your virtual machines that will be uh, acting as workers in Octopus. Um, I mentioned worker pools. These are just groups of workers. You can divide them by, for example, uh, by operation operation system. So you can have worker pool for Linux uh, workers and worker pool for Windows ones. And that's the case uh, when it comes to default uh, workers. And 
which uh, and maybe last uh, curious fact uh, by default they run tasks in parallel okay so uh, i mentioned workers um, and there is one fact that i would like to remind uh, workers by default are hosted in azure so if you if we want to connect our workers and uh, execute some scripts in our AWS cloud, we need to provide a way to, um, to the worker to connect to AWS. So first thing, first thing like the, the most basic one um, when it comes to Octopus is to provide IAM user uh, access key and secret access key, and those would be stored in Octopus as uh, account. And we can use built-in worker because we don't have time to create, like, that's example. We don't have time to create our own uh, customized worker. We can use built-in one, but it's not so good because first of all, we used built-in worker, which is hosted outside our infrastructure. So that could be a security um, issue for some companies, for some projects. Um, secondly, we use IAM user and this IAM user has like all the permissions that we require to um, like all the actions to um, to execute in AWS. So the better solution would be still using built-in worker, but um, we can also specify in Octopus that this IAM user that we are providing as an Octopus account can assume specific IAM role. So instead of uh, passing like long-term permissions to our IAM user, we can use short-term IAM role and this IAM role would have the scoped, scoped permissions, so required ones to execute our actions in AWS. And uh, even better solution, the best one would be to create the self-hosted worker in AWS so that we can, we no longer have to use IAM users because the worker which will probably uh, be EC2 instance, would have instance profile and IAM role assigned to it. And this IAM role would have uh, like the, all the necessary permissions. So uh, for me, the best um, way to uh, provide security when using workers would be to uh, create your own one. And also, uh, you can customize uh, possibilities of your worker. So that's a good point too. And speaking of, um, when it comes to toolset, built-in worker has some tools installed, um, but like the, the set is not uh, fully, um, I mean, there are some tools that you'll, require to, you'll be required to install. Yeah, that's that's probably um, sure. Um, so you can install them in a release process. You can provide the, you can define the first step. Okay, let's uh, use yum to install, I don't know, npm or Node.js or Java. Um, the better way would be to install necessary tools in your external or self-hosted worker um, in a machine provisioning script. So you create EC2 instance or any virtual machine, you register it as worker. And by the time you create the machine, you can use user data scripts to install necessary tools. But there is also a um, an operational uh, overhead because you'll you will even eventually um, have to update the versions of the tools that you install you, you should have uh, like um, the process to update those uh, libraries or applications uh, so the best solutions for me 
it would be to use a built-in or external worker. Uh, it does not matter um, at this point, but uh, there is a feature that we can run jobs in execution containers. So the prerequisite is to have Docker installed in our uh, worker and we can use a specific container uh, with, with the specific image uh, so that if we want to use uh, JDK, we use JDK image uh, from Docker Hub or any other um, Docker registry. Okay, and when it comes to packages, I mentioned that those are uh, archives. So we have accepted formats of NuGet package, zip, tar, etc. They are stored in a built-in repository because Octopus, when you install it or when you provide the cloud subscription, it has its own built-in repository. You can use external ones. Uh, they are called feeds. You can use Docker and this would be uh, Docker Hub or, or any Docker registry. There are also um, registries from cloud providers so for aws that would that would be ecr uh, you can use uh, github maven nuget uh, helm and s3 bucket as well when it comes to aws um, there are some benefits when using built-in repository there is a better performance um, since packages are already uploaded you don't have to um, like download them from external feed and then uh, send them back to your tentacles from octopus server so that's one operation uh, less there is also efficient storage because there are retention policies and you can enable them to specify how many days uh, you want to keep your um, artifacts your packages and there is also automatic release creation feature and this is only enabled uh, i mean this is only available um, when you use a built-in repository in octopus and we will see this automatic um, release creation feature and in the upcoming uh, demo sessions so uh, ways of interacting with uh, octopus server you can use web ui um, as I showed you um, during the first demo, um, I mentioned also API um, requests because all the actions that are uh, available um, in the UI are also available through requests. And I would also say that uh, there are more, uh, even more uh, actions in APIs. There is also a CLI tool um, similar to kubectl, it's uh, it's called Octo, and you can use this Octo CLI um, package or binary file uh, to execute some commands, and it's just an, a wrap up on uh, API calls um, sent to your Octopus server. Okay, um, let's go to the second demo session and. Uh, small maybe small um note from me um i just realized today that uh, there are some problems with octopus so i'm really sorry about that uh, but nevertheless i would like to show you how it's done even though the release process would not finish successfully uh, i can still show you some uh some actions that are required to uh, create a release, to deploy it, etc. So uh, I have this lambda.py file, pretty simple one. Uh, it's written in Python. Um, it has a lambda handler, and this handler prints uh, one line in into logs and returns uh, the value for the specified key. And when it comes to uh, when it comes to this Lambda function, uh, there is a single file and using Octo CLI tool that I just mentioned, we can pack uh, this file as a uh, format of zip um, archive. 
we include all the files uh, that ends with pi, but we have only one. And the second action is to um, push this uh, packed artifact to my server. And this is the address of uh, my Octopus instance. This is my API key. Um, I know um, I will delete this after this presentation. Um, we can uh, specify package here. So that would be a zip. And just for the cleaning, uh, I will remove the zip file afterwards. So this is the output. It says something about compression. Um, there is the zip file that is saved to my, lo uh, to my um, location. And as we can see, push is successful. So let's go to Octopus and check if there is any package here. OK, it is. So I called it Lambda. And the highest version, the newest one, is uh, the version that I just uh, uploaded. So it's here. Uh, we can also use any type of uh, semantic versioning. So we can provide our own 0.0.0.1 um, .0 if we want to. Um, by default, it's, uh, it's date time. So it's year, month, day, and uh, specific hour. So we have our package in Octopus. So let's go to project. And let's see um, the Lambda manual process. So as you can see, there is no release here. So we can create one. And during the creation of the release, uh, we choose packages for each step that refers to packages. So I have only one step. And it assumes there is a package. And this package would be um, referred to as AWS Lambda package. So I choose the only version I have in my built-in repository. And automatically, uh, the, the version, I mean, the release name is uh, the same as the package version, but I can name it um, as I want to. That doesn't matter. OK. And as you can see, my life cycle is uh, first deploy to UAT and then um, deploy to prod. And as you can see, I have no um, possibility to deploy to prod right away. I need to go first through UAT environment. And let's deploy. Um, when it comes to this view, we can set a um, later uh, date of the deployment. We can exclude some steps uh, if we don't want to uh, execute them. Um, what to do when it comes to failure? in your steps and whether to uh, use cached, cached packages or re-download them every time from the feed. So let's deploy. And as I mentioned, I do realize that this step will fail um, because there was a change. I mean, it, it probably happened yesterday. There is a bug, I believe. I would have to raise it to Octopus um, because um, let's go to process and I'll just show you uh, what I mean. Um, there is AWS account here and I have this uh, variable called AWS credentials and this variable AWS credentials refers to, um, refers to Octopus account that is storing my credentials for IAM user. So that's here and by default, Octopus uh, handles um, all the AWS configuration when it comes to credentials. So normally on your workstation, you would uh, put AWS configure command. You would execute this and provide some IAM um, details like your user key and access key, access key and secret access key, sorry. Uh, this is done by Octopus, and this part of uh, Octopus, I mean, they made some changes and uh, it fails now. So we can go here and, uh, yeah. And uh, also when you provide, 
I mean, when you execute AWS configure, you also specify a region. This region is specified in my process as, um, as I'm using EU central one, as you can see here, but this value is not passed into, uh, into the script. So uh, big apologies for that. Um, I just realized uh, like an hour before the demo. So obviously there will be no Lambda function here, but uh, let's imagine this, um, the, this release was green. Um, then if the deployment was successful, we could use the same method of deploying to production. Okay, so uh, that's all when it comes to this uh, demo session. So let's go uh, to the further slides. Mm, we just saw deployment method, which is not so good. Uh, first of all, I had to push my artifact. Uh, this would be done by CI uh, job or any CI tool, uh, but I had to manually create release, uh, manually deploy to UAT. Um, if I wanted to, I would have to prepare some manual tests on my UAT environment to check if my Lambda works and then schedule another manual deployment to production environment. So a better way would be to use um, at least um, automatic creation of release. So uh, whenever artifact or package is pushed to my Octopus deploy, if I use the built-in repository, I can use automatic creation of release uh, feature and the release would be created uh, for me automatically uh, so that I don't have to um, specify the details. There is one manual step uh, less. And the best method would be to, um, after pushing my artifact to the built-in repository, the, the relay, uh, sorry, the release would be created automatically. The deployment to UAT would be scheduled um, like right away. There would be some automatic tests, maybe with some manual approvals, um, but uh, that's like the optional um, step here. And after successful deployment to UAT, we can also schedule automatic deployment to production. And let's see how it's done. Uh, the automatic creation of release is done by automatic release creation. Nice name. Um, this feature is, uh, like I said, uh, upon package upload, if we use built-in repository, after um, uploading the package, the release is created automatically. Um, I also mentioned automatic deployments, like scheduling the deployments. This is done by life cycles and I will show you um, how it's done in the upcoming demo session. Um, I also mentioned approval steps. There is a special type of um, step that you can include in your deployment process and it's called manual intervention required. And this step stops the deployment process and waits for the approval. And you can also specify uh, like who can approve, uh, how many approvers do you need from which um, group of users that you have specified in Octopus, etc. So let's jump again to Octopus and see how it's done uh, when it comes to automating stuff. Okay, so as I showed you before, we had this package. Uh, I don't need to re-upload it because I have my a second project, which is called uh, Lambda Automatic. And uh, the same, uh, like the same applies here. Uh, this will fail because of uh, like this, this bug that I just discovered um, today morning. Uh, but oh, maybe let's uh, let's re-upload so that you can see that the release is created automatically. Okay, so package is being pushed. There is also a nice feature that uh, it calculates some delta 
um, as you can see, it's not not very accurate because I haven't changed anything in my Lambda Pi um, file. But uh, just to be sure that you don't uh, that you don't upload a full package every time, um, there is this delta compression, and you can also transfer a smaller package. Um, so as you can see. Uh, the, re the new release is created, and this is done by by triggers. And there is this feature called automatic release creation, and you choose which step or, or maybe which package from which step uh, triggers the automatic release creation. So it's look, it looks just like this. And when it comes to um, automatic uh, deployment of the release. Um, I mentioned there is a life cycle and let's uh, find it here or maybe uh, let's go into library and life cycles. Uh, this life cycle automatic deployment is associated by channel to, to my Lambda um, dash automatic project. So I, as you can see, uh, there is uh, there are two phases. Uh, in this life cycle. The first one is called UAT and it says, okay, let's uh, schedule the deployment to UAT uh, environment. We can add more environments if, if we have those. Uh, I mean, I have only two, but this phase could be uh, also executed uh, to dev environment if we have one. And the second one is prod and what I wanted to uh, show you is that oh, maybe um, the, the lightning um, icon here um, says it's okay, it's automatic and I don't have to create um, any manual uh, schedule for my deployments. Those would be uh, scheduled automatically. Mm, and if we go back to Lambda Automatic, as you can see, there is also error like I mentioned, uh, but but yeah, um, yeah, no lambda. Um, okay, any questions so far? If not, I will go to the last part. So we've just seen automation. There is also. I would say nice feature, oh, sorry, operational runbooks. Those can automate routine maintenance tasks. So for example, you want to provision your infrastructure, you want to patch your servers, you want to destroy your whole environment. That's also a, a valid way of using operational runbooks. Uh, you can also include some emergency operations like uh, like disaster recovery uh, scenario. For example, if you are facing disaster, you can switch your um, DNS uh, endpoints from one region to another, etc. There are like a, there is a lot of examples um, of on how to use operational runbooks. And those can be parameterized uh, as well. But the difference between a runbook and a simple project is, mm, sorry, a simple process is that uh, the runbook can have prompted variables. So for example, you want to ask a human uh, operator um, for the interaction, for, the, for some values, for um, maybe the, the choice of the environment, or maybe the name of the database that need to be uh, managed, etc. cetera. Um, and one pretty important when it comes to Octopus, uh, one thing is that runbooks belong to projects and they can be project specific. That means, um, let's imagine you have your application and your application is a Terraform um, template that has all the infrastructure, you can have runbook that is associated to this project. So uh, 
runbooks in this project would be like destroying the Terraform infrastructure. Uh, that could be also like uh, maybe applying some taints uh, in Terraform, etc. Okay, so last demo session when it comes to runbooks. And let's uh, go back here. Runbooks do um, do use the same solution when it comes to passing the credentials to uh, to workers or to deployment targets. So that won't work as well. So once again, sorry. Um, but for my Lambda function, I prepared a runbook to delete the Lambda because uh, as you as you saw um, before, the release process creates a new Lambda and it can update the Lambda. But sometimes we just want to delete this and uh, have our like our sandbox clean. So I created a simple CLI script that deletes the Lambda function specified by name. Oh, and you can see how the variables are refer uh, referred to. So it's like hash sign braces and variable name with, uh, for in this case, I am using a filter called to lower to just parse um, this environment variable to lowercase. And once again, I can schedule um, I can schedule the runbook to run against uh, different environments. So imagine we have um, functions for UAT and for productions. We can delete one of them or both of them at once, and the script will uh, will run two um, deployments or maybe um, runbook executions. And those steps uh, would delete the Lambda function so that we no longer um, have them in our AWS account. So maybe Lambda function is not the best example when it comes to deleting because it's like uh, it has no cost uh, when it's not um, when it's not uh, working. But you can imagine the same could happen to ECS clusters, to EKS cluster if you want to. Um, etc. Okay. Uh, any questions regarding this demo session? Okay. Yeah, looks like no questions. <laughs> okay. Let's go back to. Oh, let's go back to the presentation then. Um. So. This is the last theoretical slide. Um, I just wanted to share with you that Octopus can be uh, configured in code. So as you probably know, maybe some of you know Jenkins, uh, you can use Jenkins files that provide some steps, some scripts that are used in Jenkins pipelines. Uh, the same concept is applied here in Octopus. So we can store your uh, project resources in a Git repository. Uh, so you can have deployment process. So the list of steps, you can have your deployment settings and non-sensitive variables also um, saved in your Git repository. Um, this configuration as code feature uses Octopus configuration language and it's uh, mainly inspired by uh, HCL by HashiCorp. Uh, what is important is that UI remains fully functional if you use version controlled projects. So it means that even if you use version controlled projects, so you store your project resources in your Git repository, um, UI stays the same and you can also um, like see all the steps um, in UI. You can also edit the steps and there is a nice uh, two-way synchronization between Octopus and Git. You can use UI to edit some parameters, maybe add one step into your deployment process. And this uh, 
this modification um, can be committed to a branch that you choose uh, in the UI and the changes will be committed. They can be later um, reviewed in pull requests or merge requests. Um, so that's, I think it's cool feature because uh, when I, when I'm using configuration as code in other tools, there is um, by default, there is one way of um, synchronization between those tools. So by default, I mean, uh, in, in many, uh, many different tools, I see that configuration is uh, pulled from Git repository, but Octopus has also the, the second way. So it's also pushed to Git repository. Okay, so that's it when it comes to my slides. Mm, we have, I believe, a few minutes for the questions, if there, if there are any.